We can begin. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for staying so late in the conference to hear this uh, last talk. Um, I'll be talking about adversarial uh, machine learning. Some rules can be bent, others can be broken. And uh, there's a very strong thread uh, relating to the matrix going out for the slides. Maybe you'll be able to catch all of the different solo references. Um, when I built this uh, uh, deck, I was uh, thinking of uh, how to best approach a, uh, a subject matter which is oftentimes depicted as very complex machine learning and uh, uh, the mathematics that goes behind it. And on the other hand, uh, looking at it from a breaker's, uh, uh, a hacker's perspective of this is a system just like any other system. And just like any other systems, it has its rules. It has its uh, uh, ways of behavior. And those rules can be bent and those rules can be broken. So first of all, first of all uh, a legal disclaimer, I'm uh, pretty much obligated to show this slide whenever I do a talk by my employer, Intel. Um, I'm going to do some hand wavy stuff, meaning that I will not go very deep into the technical mathematical explanations behind every concept that I'm going to show uh, here, uh, and I apologize for that. On the other hand, if you feel the need to go into a deeper dive or you want me to uh, elaborate or explain further, just grab me after the talk and I'll be happy to either provide references or to elaborate a bit more about each concept. Um, uh, I really, really, really wanted to do a demo. And, and there are lots of cool things that uh, we can do. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have enough time to prepare one. So I'm going to do the next best thing, which is to show you slides. <laughs> I'm not very happy with that, but I hope that uh, you'll still uh, come away with a, a couple of new uh, concepts, a new understanding of what AI is and what kind of things we can do to that AI uh, when we start uh, really looking at it at, uh, at, at a hacker's perspective. So who am I? Uh, my name is Guy Barnhart McGinn. Uh, I'm a, a security research manager at Intel. Uh, yes, Intel does security and all kinds of interesting stuff. Uh, I actually have two different hats. I manage two different groups. One is the Software Reverse Engineering Group, and the other is the AI Security Innovation Group. Both of these kinds of fields merge together in the talk that I'm going to explain now, because when we are discussing artificial intelligence in general at a high level, it sounds like kind of a magical beast that nobody knows exactly how it works. In our day-to-day -day lives, we're talking about code, usually Python, running on a CPU and doing some math problem like multiplying matrices. So as soon as you uh, kind of move away from this mythical understanding of AI in the general terms into the software uh, very uh, grounded implementation of how you actually do this, you understand that uh, there's a lot of different ways to affect systems, uh, artificial intelligence systems, and the way that they operate. So what is artificial intelligence? Some of us, when we think about artificial intelligence, for example, my mother, they think about this. They think about the Terminator, that something is coming to destroy us. My sister-in-law does not allow my brother to buy an iRobot because she's afraid of the robot uprising and the iRobot going to climb over the bed at night and catching her. <laughs> Seriously. I have a high robot at home, my brother does not. And some people think that AI, this is what's going to happen. AI is going to take her jobs. AI is going to uh, take over everything, take over manufacturing, do everything else. This is so far from the truth of where we live at the moment that it's pretty funny. Artificial intelligence in, in general is a way of teaching machines to do uh, uh, tasks and uh, missions that usually humans used to do. We're not there. <laughs> we're not there at all. And not only we're not there, the stuff that we are able to do today, which is very limited in scope, such as uh, identifying objects inside the pictures, we are able to do in a very reasonably good way. If I have a picture of uh, uh, a woman uh, reading, uh, sitting on a sofa reading a book, then we are able to say, okay, there's a woman, there's a sofa, there's a book. But humans will be able to look at the picture and say, okay, she's being uh, uh, punished and whatever, and she has to uh, do a book report and she's very unhappy with what she's reading. Or maybe uh, she's studying for an exam, or maybe it's a leisure reading and she's reading the latest Jackie Collins novel. I don't know. But this is the level of stuff that we can do as humans and the computer systems are very, very far away from. So when we are talking artificial intelligence today, think of it the same way that we're talking about cyber. It's a big buzzword, it means nothing. We should think of it as machine learning systems. It's ways to teach machines to do specific tasks. 
one day in the future, five years, 10 years, 20 years, I don't know when, maybe we'll have a system that do, uh, are able to achieve the next milestone, the KRNR, knowledge, reasoning, and representations. We're not there yet. I am going to talk about where we are now. So the way that uh, uh, AI has kind of uh, bloomed in the last three, four, five years is uh, kind of solving all kinds of difficult problems that we weren't able to solve in the past. Uh, my history in uh, uh, computers goes a long way, a bit too long, the gray hair should show it. Uh, but I remember that uh, somewhere around the, uh, 1995 there was a nice software called Dragon Dictate. It was uh, the first uh, the, uh, commercial software to come out where you could speak and dictate to the computer and magically words would appear on your, on your uh, Word application or something like that. This was pre-Windows 95 days. So this was like a kind of magical application. It used to work like 70% recognition rates, maybe, maybe even lower than that. It never worked with Hebrew accents. It was just did not support this kind of things. But this is the kind of uh, uh, algorithmic problems that we were facing 20 years ago. We are able to solve them today because of different aspects. We have better computing power. We, have, we are able to access much more data. We are able to use machine learning to uh, correlate the, the data with the CPU powers that we need in order to create better systems. The problems haven't changed. We're doing machine vision for 20 years. We're doing uh, speech recognition, natural language processing. When you go into the papers and go into the academic studies of what machine learning is, we're talking papers from 1960, 1970s, 1980s, not something that was published 2015. The basic principles of this uh, 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 corpus of knowledge is pretty old. And we're not just now seeing applications using that, and that's the reason for the bloom. So when uh, uh, I'm speaking about machine learning, it's usually easy to categorize them into three different uh, aspects. So the buzzwords or the, uh, the professional terms for them are supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement <coughs> learning. And in plain people's speak, it usually says we're giving both, we are looking at both inputs and outputs to train the system. We're just giving inputs to the system and we have no idea what it does. And we are giving it some sort of inputs and we're taking the outputs, making sure they're the right ones and telling them that it is. So in the uh, basic algorithmic sense, it's just the way that we are structuring the data. And uh, right now, the way that the, uh, the big uh, uh, buzzwords, uh, deep learning, which you've probably heard more or less, is focused about this, uh, this area. Deep learning uh, basically is just, uh, I'm going to again hand wavy stuff, basically it's just a system where you have lots of data coming in, the system does something which few people understand, and then you have magically some sort of outputs uh, appearing on the other end. And you don't need to really teach the system anything. It will automatically do pattern recognition on the data stream going into the model. I will elaborate about it in a moment. So before we're going to dive a bit uh, uh, deeper into what machine learning is, I want you to take a deep breath and remember, this is not rocket science. Hmm. Specifically, this is not math. I'm not going to explain the math. It's good to know the math, to understand the math. But in order to understand what machine learning is and how to use it, and more specifically, how to attack it, you don't need to understand the math. You don't even need to understand the, the, the core uh, underlying principles. You just need to understand this is a black box system. It has inputs, it has outputs, and it has uh, a specific architecture and structure which you can take advantage of. Not very different for any web application or any embedded device or a, a microcontroller somewhere. It's just a system like any other system. Um, I apologize in advance, this is my handwriting. It will go in to get much worse in the next two slides. Uh, what uh, machine learning does is trying to get these curves to fit the points on, the, on this 2D graph in a way that we can uh, encircle classes of points in a way that separates those classes one between another. So if I have a class of uh, blue marks, bla black marks, and red marks, the goal, the goal and purpose for the machine learning model is to find the parameters of the curve that will make a curve that will encircle all of these, but not all of these. The way it does it is it starts with some general curve and say, oh, okay, this is not good. This is, has too many things in it, too few things of other things. Let's change the parameter a bit and try again. Let's change the parameters a bit, try again. Iterate and iterate and iterate. This is called uh, the training model, the, the training uh, phase for the model. 
So we are taking a curve, a very general curve, and we are going to mesh it and screw with it and kind of uh, reorganize it a bit in a way that we will get into an optimum point where most of the uh, red uh, marks are going to be inside that circle. It used to be a circle, now it's some other kind of curve. The way it happens is that we have some sort of inputs, some sort of function, threshold, and an output. Okay? So some input goes in, it's multiplied by some sort of uh, a weight, uh, which is just a coefficient. I'm going to multiply it by 7. I input it into some sort of function. It's a math function of whatever sort that you want to use. I'm not going to go into what kind of function exactly they are. Then you multiply the result by whatever coefficient, a, a different coefficient that you want. You check the result. Is it above 0 0.5? Is it below 0 0.5? And then you say true, false. You check that true, false against whatever you know about the inputs. Let's say that I have a, 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 an input that say this is a cat. I have an image of a cat and I know it's a cat. I can label the data and say this is really a cat. So the system will try to find the, uh, the curve that will fit most images of cats together and it will output this is a cat or this is not a cat. And if it says this is not a cat, I say okay, this is really, it is a cat. Fix the weights, adjust the weights and reiterate the process again and do it again and again and again and again until you get it right. And, and in our sense, getting it right means that the accuracy of the model rises from 0 to 100%. Usually it's less than that, but that's the goal. That's the way the, the model works. But we don't need to work with a single function. We can work with various inputs with different functions. Meaning that I can take the same image of a cat and look at it and say, this is not just a cat, this is an image of something that has whiskers, it has eyes, it has ears. And I can build the function that says, this is cat ears, these are not dog ears. Or these are whiskers, this is not just a hairbrush. And I can look at the different features of that image or that uh, input and break it into different functions that we look at different parts of that image. And again, I will iterate and iterate and iterate again until the model will be certain to an extent that this is really a cat and not something else. The, the nice thing is that I don't really need to use just a couple of different inputs. I can use uh, one model's inputs as inputs to another, uh, one function's inputs as inputs to a different function. And I can build a sort of a grid. And these grids or these networks, uh, think about the computer science, this is a, a network, and these are called neural networks. This is the basic building blocks for machine learning. So not only can I just interconnect the different uh, 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 functions on the grid, I can play with all of their weights and the relationship between the weights in the way that will help me build a super function, which is built of various interconnected smaller functions, that will actually be able to say, OK, this is really a cat and not a dog or a couch. And I use it multiple, multiple times. I can use three functions, 10 functions, 1,000 functions, 10,000 functions as heavily as my compute power allows me to do and as much time as I have to train the model. I can do it for a day, I can do it for a week, and I will get different models because the weights will keep readjusting and readjusting and kind of uh, uh, converging to a, a specific point. Last slide about the math behind this, I promise. So uh, a couple of different things that we can introduce to this concept is not only to play with functions, but we can give those functions memory. And then we get a different concept, a different architecture. Not only it knows to adjust the weights, it also remembers the result from last time, so now it can improve. This was uh, an adjustment in the right direction or the wrong direction. Am I getting better or worse at detecting the cat? Uh, we can build uh, uh, systems off systems, meaning I can take one machine learning model, the entire network grid, and fit it as input to a different network model. So it's a network of networks. And if I have a network of network of networks, we're talking about thousands and tens of thousands of functions, we're not talking about deep learning. So that's the way we move from specific single functions all the way to deep learning and the high compute power that needs to do these kinds of computations. At this point, I want to stop and just remember whatever I said about the um, uh, machine learning, the mathematical model behind it. But I want you to keep in mind from a software perspective what happens here. We have inputs, we are applying some sort of function or algorithm on them, and we have outputs. And then we are trying to measure the accuracy by saying, okay, this is the output that I expected, or this is not the output that I expected. And in a sense, this is very, very similar to this Hans horse. 
from the Clever Hans uh, uh, show from 1905. Now, this is a very interesting allegory for what's happening here. The Clever Hans was a very smart horse. It was on a roadshow going on to different uh, uh, towns and uh, cities in Germany where his trainer would go and show that this is very, very, it's a very, very smart horse. He could understand uh, 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 German dia uh, and different dialects of German. He could solve basic arithmetic questions. Uh, uh, how much is 3 plus 5? How much is 17 minus 6? Etc. It could also spell out words. A very, very clever horse. But when uh, one of the psychologists, uh, I've already forgot his name, really did a deeper dive in investigation, what happened here, he found out that this horse actually was smart, but he didn't know arithmetic, or he didn't understand German. He just had a good understanding of his trainer, and he looked for visual cues for his trainer whenever he was getting closer to uh, uh, the right answer, he would tap his foot. So he was smart enough to know when the trainer thinks that the, that the answer is correct or not, and to respond the same way. So if someone asked the horse how, how much is 3 plus 5 and then someone would say 6, he would look at the trainer, nothing. Is it 7? Nothing. He would look at the trainer, 8, and he would get all excited because the trainer was excited and would tap his foot. And everybody would look at him and say, wow, this is a very smart horse. Well, it is a smart horse. But the allegory here is that when we are thinking about machine learning systems, these AI models are as good as the inputs that you are putting into them. And the way that they learn is very different from the way from that humans learn. And that's actually the main concept of this talk. Uh, a couple of very smart people at the, the Google Brain Project, it's the Google AI um, Research Project, uh, have correctly said that we have reached the point where machine learning works, but may easily be broken. And that's the thing that I want to show you today. It works. We are at the stage that we can speak to Siri or to Cortana or whatever, and she actually can take whatever we're saying and put speech to text and put the text in some form that she can understand, and then do natural language programming, uh, uh, processing and understand what we said. So we're really at that stage. However, we also, we're also at that stage where I can easily craft a malicious input and, and completely break everything. And that's what I want to show you here today. So, when you think of AI, maybe you should think more about this model. Everybody recognize this one? Three, four, five, six. Wow, at least ten. By the way, uh, whoever didn't understand the, this reference, this is uh, Hell, Hell 9000. This is a reference that I don't expect anyone to get. I don't know what this is. Just That's a question. Had? No. Mm, close enough. This is. Anybody else? No? That's the new Voltron. Ah, Voltron! <laughs> I didn't expect anyone to get this. So, when we're thinking about uh, 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 security systems, we usually talk about three different properties. Confidentiality, uh, integrity, and authentication. And when we are thinking about machine learning models or machine learning systems, we should think, where does that fit into the security models that we think of today? I'll give you a small uh, uh, look ahead. The question is, nowhere. It's nowhere, there's none of these things. Uh, at, at this time, there's no way, uh, no way, and one of the firms actually do uh, input validations for whatever data that you're feeding into your model. You can actually pass around models in a marketplace. You have no idea who gave you that model, what did it train on, did it really build on whatever it was expected to build on. And you can do a lot of pretty exciting stuff and examples ahead. Um, there's also a couple of different things that you can do. I don't encourage you to do so, please. But you can actually do them where you craft a malicious uh, input and the AI is a computer system. Let's, let me remind you something else, uh, of something else. Uh, does anybody remember what was the first zip logic bomb? At least two or three. So, uh, just to uh, a recap. It was a very, very nice attack where you would build a zip file that when you try to expand the, the archived contents of that zip file, it would expand to terabytes of, uh, of space. This was in the pre-terabyte drive days. So we're talking about the early uh, 2000, late 90s. So the attack was that I would send an email with that zip bomb, it was about 50 k's in size, and uh, the, to some enterprise, whatever, and the enterprise antivirus uh, scanners will get the email and say, okay, this is a, there's a zip file here, let's expand and check what's inside. It will try to expand and expand and expand and expand and consume all available memory, the antivirus would crash. 
That was the attack. You would crash the antiviruses. Usually the next email to come through would just go through because the AV was down. So think about it the same way. I can craft a malicious input and feed it into an AI model. For example, let's say I have an autonomous car and one of the inputs is road signs. And I'm especially crafting that road sign that whenever the autonomous system tries to read the road sign, it crashes the, the, the AI inside the autonomous car. What happens then? Interesting stuff. Um, so uh, just to keep you on the, on the same page and, and small note, uh, a lot of the slides I'm going to show from this point onwards is from uh, different academic papers. I can't really share what uh, we're doing at the office, but uh, I'll try to give uh, references and points to whatever. I'm going to release these slides, and you can uh, get the links to each of the papers where I'm showing something okay. from, uh, both of the references slide at the end, and also a link on this page. So uh, if you're thinking about the, uh, the, uh, a system, an AI system in general, so what do we have? We have something coming from the physical domain, some object, and then we do some uh, digital representation of that object, getting something from the sensors, to, to turning that into data. And then we are uh, pushing it into the AI model, to the machine learning model, and then it would give me some sort of outputs. This is a stop sign, this is a speed limit sign, this is a, a child jumping in front of the car. And then we have to make some sort of action and some sort of decision. So this is true for, for example, for cars. Somebody is jumping in front of the car, hit the car brakes. It's also true, for example, for, an autonom uh, for a, a machine learning based uh, malware detection system on the enterprise where we, uh, some sample going in, some network traffic going in, it will try to detect it and if there's some so sort of attack or something else, it can shut down the infrastructure, for example. So what happens here? So uh, when we are talking about the, the machine learning, it starts from uh, 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 a very distinct stage and moves to a deployment model. So first we have to train the model, then we have to deploy it on whatever systems needs to uh, run, actually do their runtime instance of that model. So when we want to train the model, we start with some sort of labeled data. Here's an image, it's a cat. Here's a different image, that's a dog. Here's another image, it's also a cat, et cetera, et cetera and usually break it into two different sets. Let's say 80-20, 80-20%. And then we fit it into the system, 80% of them, and say, okay, train on this. Take these data sets, the tens of thousands of inputs, and start to understand, uh, better understand what it is. And it will reiterate and adjust the weights, and reiterate and adjust the weights, et cetera, et cetera. And then finally we'll have a, a trained model, and we can validate the accuracy of the model by taking some data that the model never saw before, the 20% that we saved earlier, and just measure the accuracy of the outputs for, the, for those uh, uh, sets. Once we have a trained model, we can move it into the uh, uh, deployment <coughs> stage and just send it to customers, put in uh, the edge devices, whatever. And then we have real world data going into the model. And then it has some sort of outputs, let's say uh, anti malware, um, uh, AI based anti malware uh, software running at the uh, laptops or personal computers. So, what are the threats to this system? So first of all, you can mess around with the data that goes, goes into the training model. And this is a real threat because a lot of times the data that goes in comes from publicly available sources. So if you have a way to modify the publicly available sources, for example, if you have added privileges for Wikipedia and you have a text parsing uh, system that is built on top of Wikipedia, you can introduce malicious influence to that system. Another way is to build back doors into AI system. And this is very interesting because you can build these back doors and there's no way today to detect them. So what does a back door in an AI uh, context mean? Let's assume that you have a system, AI system that was already trained uh, and it now knows to recognize A from B and to classify them correctly. And then you train it again with malicious inputs, but you label all of those malicious inputs as benign. And then you uh, uh, introduce the specific vector into the AI model that says whenever you encounter this class of examples, treat them as benign. It's a complete backdoor. And the reason that you can do this, for example, because some AI systems are built on top of, let's say, VirusTotal. So it takes samples from VirusTotal and it trains on those samples and it will try to see if these samples are benign or malicious according to some rules. And if you can... Uh, mess around with the way that it decides if it's a benign sample or if it's a malicious sample, then you can introduce backdoors. And I'll have a slide about that in a minute or so. 
You can mess around in the real world and introduce malicious data. Malicious data is something that I specifically craft in order to uh, uh, mess around with the AI system. Uh, I can also create examples that are cross-platform cross between AI models. A very interesting aspect of the uh, AI ecosystem is that if I build uh, one specific uh, attack on one class of AI systems, usually the same attack will work on different completely uh, different, differently trained machine learning systems, same attack will work there as well. Most attacks are cross-platforms between systems. It's a, an amazing find for me. Well, not for me, somebody else found it. It was a major discovery for me to learn it. And also, you can mess around with the model. If you have access to the model itself running on your PC or running in your cloud, or somebody else has access to your cloud and to your PCs, you can mess around with the parameters. You can change them, you can... It's not hardened in any way. So if you can change that, you can change the way that the AI perceives the world. You can make stuff that used to be uh, malicious look benign, or the other way, introduce noise. And also, and this is a completely different class of attack, you can take an AI as a black box and start ask, asking it questions, giving it an, an input and measure the output, give it a different input and measure the output. And just by looking at it as a black box system, you can train a different AI model to mimic the same model that you're uh, treating as an ARCO here, and then you have an implementation of the same machine learning from a functional perspective. You can steal IP. You can study how other uh, systems are working just by uh, querying the APIs. And another very interesting attack. I'll skip this slide. Okay, so back to the fun part. The, <laughs> The way that these things go is just like anything else. It depends on the actual details of the implementation. So all of the academic papers, all of the research uh, done at various laboratories is very fine, very good, but it's a, in a different context, the ivory tower from real world application. And whenever you drag something into the real world, implementation matters, details matters. And then you find out a lot of uh, different uh, funny things that you can do. Um, you can do a lot of stuff like hiding in the training data, uh, inserting malicious uh, noise for different purposes, uh, messing with the outputs, messing with the inputs, and there's absolutely no way today to verify when you get these models if they are working correctly or not. And I'll give you a different example. Think about software QA. It's hard work, but you can actually test to a degree that the software model that you have in your hands actually behaves as you would expect it. You can verify it. When you get an AI model, you can fit it all the positive examples that you want to make sure that it behaves as you want on positive examples. You can't really fit it negative examples to test it. There are too many negative examples. It's not the same domain. So we're talking about different order, orders of magnitude between possible positive inputs and the possible negative inputs to that system. And right now, this is an unexplored domain. You can do a lot of funny things, and most of the, the examples I'm going to show you are hinging on this uh, uh, concept. So, let's see some concepts, some real-world examples. The most basic concept you would see at lots of, uh, lots of these slides, either this or bus with an ostrich, is just saying, I have a picture of a panda, and I trained my system to say this is a panda with, uh, uh, how much that is, 57% accuracy. I take a different maliciously crafted uh, uh, overlaying layer, I multiply those with some coefficient, and then I get a, a picture of a panda that for us, for humans, still looks like a panda, but for a computer AI system, it looks like a gibbon monkey with 99% accuracy. And the point I want to show you here is that the way that the AI is looking at the images is completely different than the way that we are looking at these images. For example, uh, you can see that this is a, a handwritten digits on the top, so I have like 0 and 8 and 5, etc. And you can misclassify them very easily by introducing the small pieces of noise. So for us, we can see it's noise, just a couple of pix pixels in the, uh, uh, specific locations. But for everything else, we can see that this is not uh, really the digit, but this computer system thinks that it is. It gets even funnier when you're looking at uh, uh, introducing noise into obvious pictures. Like, we know it's a horse, we introduce some noise, now it's an automobile. Different thing, uh, we take a boat, introduce noise, now it's an airplane. So, I talked about speed signs. It's very rudimentary to take a, a, a known image of a speed sign. There are databases of, of speed signs introducing some noise and making it appear like something else. 
So this is like an academic uh, uh, approach of let's no, uh, take known inputs and modify them, and we'll show that uh, in theory this system can uh, be uh, manipulated. Uh, another example here, and this is another example of how differently uh, an AI system views the world than humans, is to look at these examples. For example, this is a starfish, this is an electric guitar, this is the African grey parrot, okay? And if you fit these images into a machine learning system, this is what it understands. That's the way it's going to classify it. And the reason it's going to, to classify these images as those outputs is because the space that is mapped into a, a specific output is much larger than we think. We would think we, need, we see a picture of a parrot, we expect to see a bird and it's gray and it has a beak. When a machine learning system looks at it, it looks at completely different features. So the amount of images that can be mapped into a gray parrot, the, uh, the African gray parrot, is much larger than actual all birds or actual all gray birds or whatever. A couple of other interesting examples. This is a bagel. I kind of can't understand why the computer says it thinks it's a bagel. This is a traffic light. We are going into twilight zone a bit here. Uh, this is, makes sense. This is a chain link fence. This is the monarch butterfly. This is a snake. This is a, 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 a four poster. This is the African chameleon. This is a vacuum, accordion, screwdriver. So when you look at these inputs, you understand that the way that the machine learning is looking at the world is fundamentally different than the way that we are looking at it. Let's look at a real world example. This is a picture of a machine washer from a laundromat next to one of the researchers' home. So they built an attack in a non-academic sense. What does it mean? They pictured it with their cell phone. They went back to the lab and ran it through the machine learning classifier and said this is a washer with 53% accuracy. Pretty good, it understood that it's a washer. They introduced some noise, printed out on a, on a piece of paper, and took another picture with the cell phone. And now, with epsilon equals 4, so a very small perturbation, a very small uh, change to the original image, now it thinks it's a safe with 34% uh, accuracy and a washer with 22% accuracy. I can see the, whatever they uh, put into it. And this is a printed job. It's not a, just a, a, in an academic sense that uh, you mo directly modify the data. They modified the data, they printed it out, and took a picture of it with a cell phone camera. We're talking about real-world applications here. And now they enlarged the epsilon to 8, and now the sa it's a safe with 37.1% accuracy, or a loudspeaker with 24%. We are way, way off the washer scene here. And it gets worse than this. So another application for machine learning, for example, is to understand text. You give it a text to read, you ask a question, and you get an answer. So this is a, a, an example of such a, a, a uh, an instance where they gave it a, a, a data set of knowledge, in, in this case on the Super Bowl, to read, to understand, and ask what is the name of the quarterback who, wa uh, who was 38 in Super Bowl 40. The original prediction should have been John Elway, but once they introduced another sentence here into the data, it confused the system, now it thinks it's Jeff D. Think about Wikipedia. We have a system, it reads Wikipedia to get us answers. If we can change a value on Wikipedia, we can change the way that the machine learning understands the answers. Or whenever we have access to the actual database that, uh, that held, uh, held this information. We don't need to make a big change. We just need to introduce small changes to the data set in order to uh, maliciously uh, affect these uh, uh, machine learning system. Another real world attack. I, I would like to draw your attention to the stickers that they put on the signs here. The love and hate, if you can see them. These stickers completely confuse the system from thinking it's a stop sign to a speed limit sign. Real world application, they took a picture of their office with an autonomous car, with an autonomous car driving system, and they took a picture of this stop sign, and the machine identified it as a speed limit sign. So think about the scenario, you're approaching an intersection, there's a stop sign, the autonomous car, this is a speed limit sign, don't go over 65 miles an hour, you may go ahead. Not a good idea. Another very interesting attack. These are eyeglasses with some uh, image printed on top of them. Mm. I'll go faster. This is a printed little. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm at the end. Uh, these glasses have some printed image on them, which is actually the malicious input they are introducing to the system. 
And if we put them on Reese's Witherspoon's face, the facial recognition AI would think it's Russell Crowe. <laughs> what kind of real world application would this have? Well, actually, if you put this one, you'd think he's Mila Hochovich. And if you put this one, you'd think he's Carson Daly. Or if you put this one on her, you'd think it's him, or the other way around. So another aspect of that specific paper was to introduce these uh, glasses that make uh, a facial recognition system either misclassify the person as a person, so you're walking through an airport and the facial recognition system can't identify you anymore, or they can misidentify you as a different person and the example they used was Putin. Okay, this is from the, the last DEF CON, a very nice uh, uh, talk which I really recommend uh, looking at. And what he did was relatively simple, but think of it in the context of what we've discussed so far. He took uh, uh, a sample, an uh, exe file sample, and pushed it into a machine learning uh, model, let's say virus total or whatever, and he said this is malicious with 75% accuracy. So he said, okay, let's tweak the sample in a sense and say, let's repl replace the uh, text section with a full section and uh, create a new text section with uh, whatever has a, a calc exe in it. And now, it's a benign sample with 49% accuracy. And he built a system that can automatically probe the, uh, the oracle, the uh, machine learning that decides if it's malicious or benign, to make sure that these samples fly be below, below the radar. Real world application, how, how to completely circumvent Evading next generation AV using AI. Uh, this is another interesting concept. They took an, a, a Pong, whoever had Atari probably remembers that game, everybody else is just a meme. Um, they took the game Pong, and then they had an AI who uh, uh, was taught to play Pong. Move this pedal, move that pedal, move this pedal, move that pedal. And then I had a different AI study the first AI and understand whatever it was, what, what input was it expecting to have in order to move the pedals. And then they gained it. So they introduced inputs, the adversary AI introduced inputs into the game to make the other player's pedal go the other direction whenever it wanted. And it completely won every game because it could force the other AI to misplay the pedal. Uh, this was also true for Chopper Command, for a Rush Hour, and uh, uh, obviously Punk. Another very interesting concept is that in the machine learning world, we're talking about fusion of different uh, neural networks. So some, uh, somebody already did the research and trained whatever model, somebody else trained these models. I can take both of these models and combine them together to have a much stronger and much more robust model. This is like a great venue for backdoor attacks. So I can take a malicious uh, 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 model that I trained myself, put it out there, and have someone introduce and integrate my malicious model into their model, and now there's no way to know that my malicious model is there. It's just integrating to whatever they're doing. And this is an example of uh, uh, one way to do that. So they took the uh, road sign database and introduced into that road sign database small perturbation. This is uh, like a small sticker of a bomb, a small sticker of a flower, etc. And they trained the model. Whenever it says this flower, this is a speed limit sign. So you can see this is obviously a speed limit sign because it says stop, and it has a small flower. Real world application. So we can combine all of these different models, and because of the supply chain uh, scenario going on here, we can't really trust where we get those models from. And if one of the uh, uh, attackers in the world would, would maliciously convert one of those inputs, he would subvert the entire supply chain allegory here. So we have no protection against that. We're not there. So to summarize, AI is not secure. When you're ever we are sold into the hype of AI security, think very, very carefully about what is the security that we're thinking of here. AI systems can be attacked. Research into AI security is in barely diaper stage at this time. There's a lot that you can do because it doesn't really have any kind of properties today. There, nobody signs their models, nobody protects, there's no hygiene, there's nothing from the concept that you would expect to have going on in that system today. So if you want to uh, mimic the same research that I've made, here are the, all of the references. I was going to release the slides, don't bother typing it into your browser. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you. Yes? How 
the question was how common it is to actually take a model for someone you don't know and incorporate it into your system. The answer is, is about as common as using Docker Hub to get Docker images that you don't really build yourselves. There are marketplaces for models. There are actually uh, free open source models like you want to have a facial recognition system, you just download a facial recognition system and you hope it works. And usually it does to some extent. Questions? Yeah. Absolutely not. The question was, uh, has re the recent advances in AIs playing computer systems and other uh, changed the way that I view the general applications of AI? Are we in a, in a strong AI sense that uh, as in NP complete? Are we in a complete AI stage? The answer to that is absolutely not. And the reason is that we know how to build an AI for very specific problem sets. And we've discovered in many, many different areas that when we try to generalize, it breaks. So we know how to make computer vision systems. We know how to make natural language processing. We don't know how to do both. OK? Well, yet. Yeah. Um, the question was, have I researched any kind of the AI application systems in Azure and other cloud platforms? So the answer, I've researched applications, not specifically for the cloud instances. Um, Intel has its own uh, thing, like uh, it's uh, from a company called Nirvana. So there are lots of software SDKs and different frameworks and stuff that you can match together. TensorFlow from Google is usually the most uh, recognized one today, the easiest to work with. So frameworks is one thing, application is kind of a different thing. So usually what you get from the cloud providers, either uh, a framework or a system to train your models faster, but not really an application. And there are vendors that are selling you applications, like do you want a facial recognition system? Here's the API. But they haven't researched these for the most part. Okay? Okay, sorry, yeah. Uh, how much research has gone into offensive AI? Uh, offensive AI is a pretty, pretty young field in the uh, uh, offensive as in the way hackers view this. Uh, I would say that a handful of researchers, maybe 100 worldwide are even looking at these problems. Uh, researchers are looking at it in a more real sense and not in an academia sense. Maybe a quarter of that, and just like last two, four, two to four years, we actually seen papers come out. So most of the papers that you see here are from the last three years, more or less. And the cyber grant challenge. The not cyber grant challenge, uh, really, uh, in the last year. So not a lot more than that. Okay. Thank you very much.